my gosh. Oops. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to rewind. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Natasha. No, none of this would be happening without the leadership of the OECS Commission. Um, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the Commission is the entity uh, dedicated to regional integration. And as that entity, the Commission has a unique view of events in the region and a responsibility to stimulate the responses when needed. Honorable Joseph Easton Taylor Farrell is the current chairperson of the OECS Commission. Jill, I need the bio. Continue. Okay. Um, okay, maybe you can read the bio for me because I can't see it. I'll change the pin screen, All right? Okay, great. Um, I need you to read it for me, sorry. I... Jill, can you just introduce the premier for me, please? Honorable Joseph E. Farrell, the premier of Montserrat, premier and minister of finance and economic management with responsibility for local government, immigration, information, communication, foreign affairs, culture, tourism, and trade. The Honorable Joseph E. Farrell was appointed Premier of Montserrat on the 19th of October, 2019. He's a member of the Montserrat Legislative Assembly for approximately 15 years, having served as a legislator for two, from 2006 to 2009. Minister of Agriculture, Land, Housing and Environment from 2009 to 2014, and Leader of the Opposition from 2014 to 2019. Prior to holding political office, Premier Farrell worked hard for many years as an ardent uh, civil servant for the benefit of the agricultural sector and the welfare of Montserrat Unions. Honorable Far Farrell is also a lay preacher at the Methodist Church. As a leader of the government of the British Overseas Territory devastated by volcanic eruptions in the late 1990s, Premier Farrell continues to strive towards a fuller measure of economic recovery and self-government from the people of Montserrat. Premier, can you go ahead? Good. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to accept or to adopt the protocol that's been established and simply to say good morning to all of you. It is my distinct pleasure to bring greetings and to bring brief remarks on this the opening ceremony on the occasion of the UN Human Security Trust Fund Technical Workshop being held in St. Lucia. I wish to begin my brief remarks this morning by setting the context for the, co for the convening of this regional technical workshop. And in the process, I also seek to articulate the reason for this very important regional dialogue. There is no doubt that the OECS region is inescapable challenge by environmental disasters. Our shores have been impacted by numerous natural disasters over several decades. While tropical storms account for a significant portion of these events, the Caribbean region, region's experience goes beyond impact from hurricanes and droughts. Given that most of our islands are volcanic in, the, in their formation, we have also experienced a few volcanic eruptions over the decades. Most recently, the eruption of La Soufrière in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2021, and closer to home in 1995, we experienced the eruption of the Super Hills volcano here in Montserrat. Moreover, in the context of the climate change discourse, we have noticed that over the last two decades, our region has been struck by more severe and dangerous tropical storms. All of our countries can attribute some historical destruction and loss of property and even loved ones to a major tropical storm event. Examples include Hurricane Ivan in Grenada in 2004, and more recently, 
In 2017, Hurricane Irma and Maria in Antigua and Barbuda, the British Virgin Islands and Dominica in the case of the latter. The experience of Hurricane Irma and, and Maria highlight the argument among climate change advocates that this phenomenon is a real accidental threat to economic and human survival. It should be noted that in 2017, there were approximately 367 natural disasters observed worldwide, the e economic losses surpassing 230% GDP, compared to an average of 354 observed natural disasters, which took place between 2007 and 2016. In the case of Dominica, it was estimated that Hurricane, Hurricane Maria accounted for GDP losses of 225%. Hence, in the context of climate change, tropical storms are becoming more frequent and more ferocious, leading to significant economic and social losses. Important to appreciate, therefore, is the human side of these natural disasters, as they do not just deprive us of our livelihoods, but also cause significant loss of lives and is a major push factor environmental mitigation among our people. These environmental disasters have also brought about significant environmental migration. My homeland, for instance, experienced a very good example in the case of the eruption of Super Hills Volcano in 1995, which led to a massive displace displacement of the southern part of Montserrat and the relocation of the capital Plymouth to Braids in the north. To date, the south part of the island, which we define as the exclusion zone or most fertile lands, remains uninhabitable and uncultivated. More recently, with the passage of Hurricane Irma, we saw the entire population of Barbuda relocated to mainland Antigua. And there were also significant mass movements of Dominicans and residents following the devastation of Hurricane Irma in 2017. It was estimated that 1.3 million new displacements occurred in the Caribbean between 2018 and 2021 due to disasters such as these. With every displacement comes the psychological impact and grief associated with leaving behind one's place of residence, place of employment, and in many cases, family members and loved ones. For many, moving to completely new environments and often under conditions of great uncertainty, this reality is the less spoken dimension of the effects of climate change and environmental migration on the peoples of the OECS region in the wider Caribbean. The OECS region and the wider Caribbean is very resilient. Nonetheless, while we have limited influence in preventing the severity of hurricanes, nor the ability to avoid seismic events as volcano eruptions, we have within our reach the ability to build resilience, resilient communities and econo economies. At both the national and regional levels, efforts towards strengthening infrastructure at the coastal regions are ongoing. Studies towards collecting data that will strengthen policy making are also contributing to building our national and collective resilience. These efforts are essential to ensuring, for instance, that our fishing communities situated along our coastal regions can survive the climate change induced events, including that brought about by major tropical storms. Environmental migration presents a particular peculiar challenge. There are two areas of concerns, border security and risk and national and regional costs associated with relocation or displacement displaced population both internally and across borders. In many ways, lessons have been learned from the experience of Hurricane Maria, which presents OECS countries with both challenges. Since this experience, the OECS Commission, in collaboration with international partners, such as International Organization for Migration, the Platform on Disaster Displacement, the German Corporation for International Cooperation, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, along with regional institutions such as CEDEMA and the CARICOM impacts, 
have developed training programs to help border officials respond to the border security threats associated with environmental migration. The capacity building in initiatives which benefits the border officials and supporting agencies have increased these officials' ability to receive environmental migration, environmental migrants, both vulnerable persons and families, and preserve national and regional security. There's also the need to enhance the ability of receiving countries to finance the integration of OECS nation, nationals and residents displaced by environmental crises. Receiving countries must, in this regard, advance people-centered policies. To do so, they must possess the capacity to provide for the needs of displaced populations, including food, shelter, and other basic needs. Furthermore, the social and economic systems must have this, the absorption capacity to accommodate these populations, providing for schools placement, healthcare, income support, and employment. In the context of the OECS Economic Union, a framework exists to facilitate the ease of, of movement of OECS citizens from political member states, and to date it is recognized as an international best practice for building resilience among small island states. However, more effort is required to address the absorption capacity of the economic union in times of shocks, that is what was experienced following Hurricane Maria. I take this opportunity, therefore, on behalf of the OECS countries, our gratitude to the United Nations for advancing this UN Human Security Trust Fund run program. In particular, the development of cross border protocols under this initiative will help provide guidance to our governments in considering the human centered policy environment that is needed to respond adequately to the needs of environmental migrants. In terms of issues around their survival, livelihood, and dignity of their community members, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Collaborations such as this one can go a long way in supporting our national and collective responses to human mobi mobility due to environmental migration. Moreover, at the regional level, the OECS continue to broaden relationships with international development partners to help to achieve the five strategic priorities. In particular, the UN Human Security Fund Trust, Trust Fund Grant Program is helping to advance strategic priorities three to five to address its efforts towards valuing the environment, building resilience, and advancing equity and inclusion. I wish, therefore, that all the participants of this workshop will have a very successful meeting and we look forward to very positive outcomes. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. Um, and we know that uh, Montserrat has had a very um, they've had their own share of experience in this um, disaster displacement and, and environmental migration story. Um, and so this is a very important discussion for um, Monstrat as well as the rest of the Eastern Caribbean. Um, we welcome next to the virtual podium, <laughs> um, Mr. Didier Tribuk the UN resident coordinator in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. As we said, this is a joint program that is being done under the umbrella of the UN Regional um, Resident Coordinator's Office. Um, Mr. Didier Tribuk is an economist, was appointed by the UN Secretary General as UN resident coordinator for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean in January 2019. He brings more than 20 years of experience in the development and humanitarian realm, working with the United Nations and international NGOs. As resident coordinator, he leads the UN sub-regional team and is the highest ranking official of the United Nations development system at country level. Mr. Tribuk. 
Good morning, uh, Master of Ceremony. Can, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay, good morning, um, everyone. Uh, allow me first to, protocol has been established, but allow me first to acknowledge uh, and, and, and greet um, Honorable Joseph Farrell, Premier of Montserrat and Chairman of the OECS, representatives of the Government of the Eastern Caribbean, CBIMA, my colleagues from IOM, UNFCCC, and the Platform on Disaster Displacement, of course, uh, our uh, support entity for this joint program, the UN Trust Fund for Human Security. So good morning again. It's really my pleasure to welcome you in this workshop uh, on this very important topic to mainstream human security approach uh, in the OECS member states. And I want to congratulate for this, of course, the OECS and the various uh, member states participating in this endeavor. Uh, IOM and UNFCCC being the two lead agencies implementing this program in the region uh, with the support of the UN Trust Fund for Human Security and partnering with the Platform on Disaster uh, Displacement. So congratulations first on, on convening this very important workshop. This is, um, of course, for us a prime opportunity uh, with you all to raise awareness in the region on human mobility in the context of disasters and the climate crisis, a climate crisis that is constantly growing as we all observe it. And this is really the, the John's program focus. So climate change is a defining crisis of our time. Um, disaster displacement if it's one of its most devastating consequences and we can expect uh, that this consequence is to uh, impact further uh, most vulnerable uh, directly on the front line uh, of disaster uh, crisis and climate crisis in the near future. So that's why it's important that we start addressing and anticipating uh, this sort of event. And as we all know, the Caribbean region stands in the front lines of the current climate crisis and it's as uh, based on, on a study from the IEP, uh, it really threatens threatens to displace 1.2 billion uh, people worldwide by 2050 uh, and add, of course, to the growing phenomenon of climate refugees worldwide. So uh, the region ranks amongst those with the highest vulnerability worldwide. The IMF research tells us that our region is seven times more likely to experience natural disasters than larger states and incur as much as six times more damages. Uh, the frequency of natural disasters within the region means also that recovery can take years. Uh, Dominica and Antigua and Barbuda are fresh in our mind from the passage of uh, Hurricane Maria and Irma just six years ago, Dorian more recently in the Bahamas. Uh, so we know what can be the consequences, including in terms of uh, people's displacement. And yesterday again, uh, the, the, a new report, a new alarming report, I would say, was published by the International uh, Panel for Climate Change. And it tells us that within a little bit more than 10 years, only 10 years, uh, the global warming which will reach uh, an increase of uh, global temperatures by 1.5 degrees. So that really tells us about the importance to adapt and the urgent need to adapt to strengthen people's resilience primarily. Uh, besides, of course, reducing global warming, uh, glo global greenhouse uh, emissions, and hence the relevance of uh, human security principle uh, that we're doing here. So strengthening disaster risk management and, and risk reduction measures, along with uh, enhancing the adaptiveness of safety nets, such as uh, shock responsive social protections, are really key to prevent, uh, key to adapt, to respond to the impact of climate-related shocks uh, and disasters, amongst others. So um, that's why disaster risk reduction, you know, view provides people and communities with the key skills that are needed to address the consequences uh, of this crisis and to mitigate future effects through transformed behavior, through uh, especially, of course, for uh, the most vulnerable who always are the first impacted. And that includes women and girls, people with disability, of course, displaced person, children, uh, and, and other vulnerable segment of the population, like the elderly in particular. So by educating uh, the people at large on the effect of disaster impact and environmental degradation on human mobility, uh, we feel that we can really minimize the risk of displacement and achieve new solutions uh, for the people on the move 
or who are at risk of moving. It's important to recall that our regional actions and efforts must remain always people-centered. Uh, persons displaced by disasters and environmental migrants generally suffer from lack of protection and enhanced vulnerabilities. Uh, due to lack of access to basic services in many cases uh, or security to meet their specific needs. And I really re recognize truly the important measures that have been con uh, considered and that um, already exist to face those challenges. And I'm really glad that this joint program is supporting this momentum, uh, seeking to harmonize national policies and regional protocols at the same time. So the phase one of this joint program, as I said, bringing two UN entities and, and, and the rest of the UN team to address uh, this challenge in the futures. This is what brings us together uh, through this workshop because it will allow us to, to review the national assessments, uh, identify best practices and generally increase regional awareness on the human security approach. Uh, so I'm happy to announce as well that a, that a phase two of this endeavor is being considered currently to scale up intervention through greater involvement of other regional bodies such as CARICOM and expand those who benefit from the program, include, uh, including, of course, uh, community-based uh, disaster risk reduction and engagement. So I, I want to invite uh, really participants and organizers today to take advantage of this workshop uh, con to continue all the existing efforts to network, share experiences and lessons to better address uh, human mobility in the context of disasters and climate change, uh, integrating this perspective of human security. So again, it gives me really great pleasure to, to welcome you uh, today, and I wish you great success in this endeavor. Thank you very much. context for us this morning. Um, our next speaker is the IOM Regional Director for Central and North America and the Caribbean. Ms. Michelle Klein-Solomon is a national of Switzerland and the United States of America. Um, and she's the Regional Director for the Central and North America and the Caribbean for the International Organization for Migration, IOM, based in San Jose, Costa Rica. She assumed this position on 31st of October of August, I'm sorry, 2020, and provides advice to governments in all regions of the world and to regional, intergovernmental, and non-governmental entities on a wide range of migration policy matters. Prior to her current assignment, Ms. Klein-Solomon served as the first director of the newly established policy hub in the office of the director general at IOM. The Policy Hub is designed to draw together and deliver policy knowledge across the organization. The Hub is a catalyst to promote effective collection, analysis, and exchange of policy re relevant data and knowledge, and to facilitate strategic migration policy advice based on expertise from across IOM. Ms. Klein-Solomon holds Juris Doctor and Master of Science in Foreign Service degrees from Georgetown University and an honorary doctorate of Humane Letters and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Colgate University. Ms. Klein-Solomon unfortunately is not able to be with us in person virtually, uh, but we have a recorded message from her. Dear UN Resident Coordinator Didier Trebuk, Dear PDD, Head of Secretariat Adler Solberg, good to see you. Dear OECS Permanent Secretaries, Dear UNFCCC Deputy Executive Director and my good friend, Obey Saman, dear Sadima Deputy Executive Director, Kessler Craig, dear Hitumi Kubo, Office of the Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Human Security, dear distinguished representatives of OECS countries, dear friends and colleagues. As you all know, small island developing states are recurrently exposed to climate-related threats, being especially prone to disasters that are up to six times more damaging when compared to developed states. The Caribbean region is the second most hazard-prone region in the world, given frequent and in many cases 
devastating impacts from multiple hazards, such as hurricanes, extreme flooding, volcanic eruptions, and earthquakes, all compounded by the exacerbating effects of climate change. The advent of COVID-19 further exposed additional layers of vulnerability that work to undermine social and economic safety nets and increase human insecurity in the region. It is well recognized that in the absence of adequate frameworks, persons displaced by disasters and environmental migrants can suffer from a lack of protection and enhanced vulnerability. Research has highlighted that limited harmonization of national policies and lack of regional protocols affects the capacity of states to provide comprehensive responses to human security threats. The pervasive vulnerability of Caribbean islands supports the need for people-oriented and comprehensive approach to effectively address the challenges facing the region, thereby increasing the protection and empowerment of Caribbean people. This is why this workshop is such a fantastic opportunity to advance the development of adequate frameworks and policies to enhance human security agenda in context of mobility derived from environmental hazards. This joint program on integrating the human security approach in disaster displacement and environmental migration policies in the Eastern Caribbean represents a major step in strengthening regional and national response strategies. This intervention puts the well-being of migrants, displaced persons, and vulnerable communities at the center of attention, thus advocating for the adoption of frameworks that can help in addressing these movements in a timely, adequate, and protection-sensitive measure. Manner. I would like to seize this opportunity to thank the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security for the funding and technical support made available to implement this action. Our gratitude also goes to the UN Resident Coordinator Office in Barbados for the leadership assumed in this initiative and partners at the UNFCCC Regional Coordination Center in Grenada and of course the PDD. Finally, this project would not have been implemented without the collaboration and engagement of the OECS Commission, other regional partners, and each OECS member state who have shared their insights and participated in the different project activities. Back in November 2022, COP27 in Egypt ended with an increased acknowledgement of the importance of addressing human mobility in climate action and a commitment to establish a specific funding arrangement for loss and damage. As the preparatory work advances, it is fundamental that the needs of Caribbean countries in advancing safe migration, preventing and averting displacement, and improving the conditions for the planned relocation of the most vulnerable communities move forward. We are looking forward to working with you in this endeavor to ensure that your perspectives are integrated in the path towards COP28. Thank you very much and have a great workshop. I wish I could be there with you in person, but I'm quite convinced you're gonna have a very interesting discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and that sets for us as well, the sort of broader, where does this information, what we're doing over the next two days, where does it feed to and where does it lead to? Um, and so we thank Ms. Klein-Solomon for that. Um, I want to take the opportunity to welcome online uh, Mr. Patrice Quesada, who is the IOM Caribbean Coordinating Office um, leader. Patrice, thank you for being with us today. Um, all right, so we move on with the program. And next we will have Mr. Oves Samad, who is the chairman of the... Yeah, we have the wrong title there. Mr. Samad, <laughs> I'm sorry, is the Deputy Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Mr. Sama joined the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat in September 2017 and supports the Executive Secretary in managing the UNFCCC Secretariat and its staff, advising on a range of issues relating to the strategic operations planning and development of the organization. 
Previously, he served as Chief of Staff to the Director General at the International Organization for Migration in Geneva. Mr. Samad worked in several management and policy capacities in IOM over a period of 27 years. Prior to IOM, he worked in the private and public sectors in London, where he qualified as a Chartered Management Accountant and Chartered Global Management Accountant. Mr. Samad graduated from Omani University in Hyderabad, India, as a Bachelor of Commerce. Welcome, Mr. Uwais Samad. Thank you very much, Maxine, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. But first of all, Honorable Joseph e Easton Taylor Farrell, distinct uh, Premier of Montserrat. Uh, actually, my name of my wife happens to be Montserrat, so it's it's a it's a <laughs> there. Uh, distinguished participants, thanks very much to IOM Mission in Dominica, the form of my, uh, the organization that I was associated with for over twenty seven years. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here. The organization of Eastern Caribbean states. Uh, commission and the platform on disaster displacement for co uh, for co-organizing this extremely important event for and for the invitation to UNFCCC. At the outset, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of other important stakeholders without whom the efforts on the ground in the region would not be possible. And that is the UN Trust uh, Fund for Human Security, uh, the UN resident coordinator in Barbados, and most importantly, all member states' representatives. The UN climate change is part of this collaborative work through our regional collaborative center for the Caribbean that is based in St. George, and they're present in this uh, event in person, as you all know. I wish I could also be there, but uh, these days, uh, getting around, it, it's quite challenging given various competing priorities. Uh, let me set some brief context uh, of what I'm going to say. Uh, you all must have uh, read about yesterday's IPCC report uh, that clearly highlights that every fraction of a degree of temperature rise is a matter of life and death to millions, especially the most vulnerable people in the developing world. And you must have also heard the Secretary General of the United Nations in this, uh, uh, once the report, the report was published, he said something similar, uh, like as follows, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, and all at once. It is therefore imperative to limit and stop greenhouse gas emissions through accelerated multi-level governance, cross-cutting partnerships and large-scale climate action. The Paris Agreement, of which we are the custodians, acknowledges that governments when taking climate action should promote and consider inter alia human rights, the rights of migrants, it is clearly mentioned in the Paris Agreement, and the right to development. The number of people at risk from impacts of climate change and future losses and damages is projected to increase. It's already happening, uh, but is projected to increase progressively with the global warming, which is unfortunately on the rise. Often, as we all know, the most impacted communities are also the most vulnerable, resulting in unequally distributed losses and damages across the systems regions and sectors. This brings people on the move, small island nations being at the front line of the climate crisis. Acknowledging the importance of impacts of climate change, especially on the most vulnerable, as you all would have uh, noticed, at COP27 last year in Sharm el Sheikh, there was an important and historical decision that was made, uh, taken to establish a loss and damage fund which we are working on to fully operationalize it and present it at COP28 later this year in United Arab Emirates. Involuntary mobility constitutes a risk for significant economic losses and non-material costs, which are wide ranging and case specifics and ultimately increase vulnerability. In this regard, governments and all parties in our case uh, cooperate under the so-called Warsaw International Mechanism 
for losses and damage of the UN climate change process, to respond coherently to this threat, to enhance knowledge, to improve coordination, and enhance action and support for losses and damages in developing countries. Within the Warsaw International Mechanism is the Task Force for Dis Task Force on Displacement, working on, under that, which strives to ensure coherent efforts on global processes and regional initiatives relevant to human mobility and climate change nexus. Many of you are founding members of this task force, and I'm very pleased that you continue to work in this regard. The efforts of the task force have helped raise the profile of the issue, not only by the government, but also across the UN system. Last year, again, the UN Secretary General's action agenda on international displacement included, included as one of the goals to address displacement proactively and systematically as part of UN's work on climate change. And this is being implemented across the UN system through the resident coordinators networks. Enhancing our collective effort is as urgent as ever, especially in supporting governments to ensure that displacement risks and associated protection needs are systematically considered within national policies and plans. As we move forward to COP28 later this year, it is time to use every opportunity to assess and promote good practices addressing climate-induced human mobility. Again, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I wish you fruitful discussions and a successful outcome, and to reiterate UN climate change, including through its regional collaborative center in St. George, looks forward, we look forward to continue working closely with all stakeholders present today and beyond to address this existential threat of climate change that we are all facing. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm sorry to uh, uh, miss not to mention my good friend, Michelle Klein Solomon from IOM, uh, who was on video a few minutes ago. It was a great pleasure to see her. Back to you, uh, Maxine. Thank you. Thanks to all. Thank you, Mr. Samad. And again, thank you for the work that the UNFCCC does. Um, you know, climate change has become such a real thing for us here in the, in the Eastern Caribbean. Um, particularly over the past few years. Um, so the need to address displacement proactively and systematically, um, I think is a need that we have all recognized. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why we are here today. Um, next up, we call on Mr. Atle Solberg, who is the head of the Secretariat of the Platform on Disaster Displacement, PDD. PDD is one of the partners also in this project. Atle is a political scientist from Norway, and he was the head of the Nansen Initiative Secretariat, the predecessor of the Platform on Disaster Displacement from 2012 to 2015. His background is primarily from international human, humanitarian action and from working in the context of displacement, both in conflict and natural hazard situations. He has worked for the UNHCR and UN OCHA in Switzerland, the Balkans, and in Central America, and for the Norwegian Refugee Council NRC in the Balkans, Indonesia, and Colombia. He has research and teaching experience from the University of Bergen on humanitarian issues, as well as on the protection of unaccompanied minors. Atle has also undertaken evaluation of humanitarian aid and worked as a consultant both with a focus on Norway as well as on the post-conflict recovery situation in the Balkans and Central America. Let's welcome Mr. Atle Solberg. Thank you so much, uh, Maxine. Can you hear me okay? We're hearing you perfectly. Thank you so much. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, dear excellencies. Um, Honorable Joseph Farrell, Premier Montserrat and, and Chair of OECS, all protocols uh, observed. On behalf of the Chairmanship of the Platform on Disaster Displacement, PDD, the European Union and Kenya, let me thank you for having this opportunity to provide opening remarks during this technical workshop. And also take this opportunity to thank each one of you for attending the technical workshop in St. Lucia. 
My name is Atlas Solberg, and I'm joining you today virtually uh, and in my capacity as head of the Secretariat of the PDD uh, from Brussels. I'm attending the European Humanitarian Forum 2023, so I can unfortunately not join you in person in St. Lucia. But we are well represented by my colleague Juan Carlos Mendez Baquero, who's our regional advisor based in Costa Rica. The PDD is a state-led initiative focusing on the implementation of the Nansen Initiative Agenda for the protection of cross-border displaced persons in the context of disaster and climate change, or as we more commonly refer to it, the Protection Agenda. We work towards better protection for people displaced in the context of disaster and climate change, as well as more effective prevention of such displacement. As it has already been mentioned, uh, this regional workshop is intended to inform a much larger two-year program led by the International Organization for Migration, titled Promoting a Human Security Approach to Disaster Displacement and Environmental Migration Policies Integrating the COVID-19 Pandemic Response in the Eastern Caribbean, which we are very happy and very honored and proud to be part of. It's very encouraging to see the OECS region so actively engaged in the issue of disaster displacement and eager to advance a well-informed regional dialogue on this topic, which is very much aligned with our goal as a global state-led process seeking to promote the protection of people displaced in context of disaster and climate change. The OECS Commission has partnered with IOM the United Nations Framework Convention Secretariat, PDD, and others to discuss and design relevant tools, which we'll be discussing over the next two days, building on existing best practices and advances in the region, such as environmental migration, disaster displacement, and human security assessment tool, a set of non-binding regional best practices, and finally, a draft protocol document for cross-border evacuation. This technical workshop also builds on existing collaboration practices started by the OECS Commission in partnership with CARICOM Impacts, CEDEMA, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and other projects led by agencies such as GSZ, including a recent capacity building virtual seminar in which we also gave support. I would like to congratulate the OACS Commission for this leadership and to advance this agenda in the Eastern Caribbean region. And all government officials who have attended the different regional consultation and virtual workshops since 2019. The issue of cross-border disaster displacement is serious and challenging. It requires regional coordination, the strengthening of national capacities and a whole of government approach. It implies a robust discussion on humanitarian protection tools and appropriate admission and stay measures in disaster and climate change context. Speaking from the European Humanitarian Forum 2023 here in Brussels in Belgium, it's clear to me the relevance of this work, particularly in the context of the adverse effect of climate change. And we also heard from some speakers the recent findings from the synthesis report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So this is an urgent and a serious matter. We at the Platform on Disaster Displacement are determined to contribute and keep supporting the OSCS Commission commitments and goals to address protection needs and the drivers of human mobility in the context of natural hazards, environmental degradation and adverse effect of climate change and to protect those who are compelled to leave their countries in this context. Finally, we would like to thank the United Nations Trust Fund on Human Security in the Eastern Caribbean for the funding of this regional event and to help states in the region to en en enhance their national capacities. We look forward to continue our collaboration in the future, and I thank you all for your attention. Warm regards from Brussels. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we may more send more reasonably send warm regards from the Caribbean to Brussels. <laughs> but thank you for that um, and for the partnership of the PDD in this project. Um, We're going to break up all these speeches a little bit right now and present to you some practical um, demonstrations of how the human security principles and approach um, how is human security affected by when people are displaced by disasters or environmental um, 
situations. Um, these are testimonies from people within our OECS region who have been affected, as well as from some of you in the room who have given us your input into this. And so it will help us to maybe put it in a very practical sense. What is this theoretical thing all about that we're going to be discussing over the next two days? So we're going to share with you now a short video on the human security um, effect in the OECS region. After nine months, we moved back to Dominica because one, we wanted to come back home and then our living arrangements was temporary and still we are getting some issue with our auntie because it's like, you know, children will be children and then she does normally have to deal with children on a normal basis like a living basis, so it is starting to get challenging for her. Now that we are back home, it's still difficult because our when we actually get back to our house, we just have to live in the workshop. The only thing that I could do was pack up the kids and at the time the ferry was coming in in phone calling. So I had to just get up really early and just go there hoping that I could get a space with the kids. It was, it was guaranteed, but I just had to try. And I did get I did get on. Um, my baby at the time, I didn't even have a book paper or anything for him. So it's a good thing I knew somebody who wrote up a document and then luckily I had a ping pong of the baby. So they just gave me a document that I could use to travel with him. Normally, procedures, plans, guidelines that are supposed to be used in terms of evacuating persons. And in order to ensure the guidelines, the plans and procedures that are used for evacuations actually work, it is important to test them through simulation exercises. Evacuation simulation should be conducted as a means of testing the preparedness of the people and even to create, to look at the, how we could say, the loopholes, the bottlenecks that may arise that give a chance for evaluations so that we could correct some things that may have gone bad in the event of a real hazard. That time, my mother, sister, and brother lived in town, and so they moved over to where I lived. But the eruptions continued, and they progressively got worse. We really crowded, but we had to do what we had to do. And at that time, I had a 10-year-old daughter who had epilepsy and a three-year-old son, and I just considered him to be a baby. Because I thought we had a September came and we had gone back to work and I realized that I was at work and my children were elsewhere and we were told that while at work we were responsible for the people who we taught and the same would be true for where our children went to school. 
but I still felt really uncomfortable with that. I remember at night, he used to get terrible nightmares where the volcano had erupted and everyone was running away from the volcano and I was running into it to find my children because I had no idea where they were. And these nightmares continued and I thought, I can't live like this. I have the prospect of having to live in a church, a school or under a tent. I can't do that. Not with a daughter, with, daughter with epilepsy and a baby. And the night being on top of that, and I decided, no, I needed to leave. So I decided to leave and go to the UK. I was living in the police quarters because I was married to a police. And then we had this girl, a school child, who had to be on her own most of the time when we were evacuating, when we were on call and stuff like that. When we had that heavy ash fall, all the thunder, the lightning, the whole place turning black, all of us being scared. I applied for housing. When I went to the housing department, uh, I was told we knew nothing of the man's right situation, so I was literally turned away. I would have liked for um, people like me who were called essential services workers to have a special place that you and your family can um, inhabit or live, that there were procedures in place instructing us of what to do if you have a family. If you're single, this is what you do. If you have a family, this is what is available for you and for your family. So we had the pandemic, then we would have had the dengue, then we would have had the vol volcanic eruption, we would have had floods just after the volcanic eruptions where we saw some of the first heavy lahas coming down towards the end of April. We had our first explosive eruption on April the 9th to the 22nd, there are about 32 explosive eruptions. Most of our shelters are, are schools and churches, community centers, learning resource centers. So we do activate those um, systems, that system, the shelter management system, open our doors for persons who may need some a place to a place to shelter. Um, that's in that's in the before and immediately after the the impact. So it was the first time in our in in at least in our operations here at Nemo because we were established in 2002 that we have had some shelters being operated that long and we still have a few persons around in in one in one particular shelter remaining. And our government has had a policy of supporting persons who have been displaced from disasters over the years. We have had the housing program and rehabilitation program where homes are rehabilitated, homes are rebuilt, and people are relocated from dangerous areas, from riverbeds. From the volcanic eruption, one of the first things that we recommended and we did was to clearly have the physical planning um, department do the mapping exercise to determine which areas were, would be unsafe for rebuilding because we know the volcano is going to erupt again whether it's in my lifetime or someone else's lifetime it's going to erupt again and we do not want um, development taking place, place in these same areas that you know the lahars are going to come down the pyroclastic flows are going to come down They provided a C-130 aircraft that effected an immediate evacuation of the entire area. Being that there was another category for, I think, um, hurricane following Irma's wake. So that really gave us less than 48 hours to try and effect a complete evacuation of the country. In my lifetime, nothing like that has ever happened. Uh, I don't even think that 
most persons were even thinking that that would have been uh, an eventual response, but it, it, it needed to, do, to be done. And I would also give strong commendation to the government for being so proactive and decisive in their actions as getting the person um, airlifted from um, you know, when he, as soon as the reality of, of Abuda's um, destruction was made uh, public, what we saw in Antigua was a massive outpour, outpouring of public goodwill, as well as mobilization, especially on the part of government, as well as different agencies and organizations society, particular church, to effect um, the collection of, of, of supplies, emergency supplies, uh, and other forms of relief. So you had the government's response and, and the, the, the use of facilities um, like the Vivian Richard Stadium and other areas that they could have absorbed some of these uh, post-migrants. Yeah, so um, I think the video demonstrated in a very real way, hopefully brought to a practical um, sense some of the effects that um, disaster displacement can have on individuals and some of their own suggestions as to what are some of the solutions that we could try to put in place in, in policy from a human security um, standpoint. Um, I want to pause again to, rec to um, recognize the presence of Esther Rigobert, who is the permanent secretary in the office of the prime minister in St. Lucia. Um, we thought that she was not going to be able to join us, but we are thankful that she has been able to, to make it. And so welcome and thank you for being present today. Okay, so I'm going to hand over now to Mrs. Viola Pascal. Mrs. Pascal is the project coordinator um, for this project on behalf of IOM. Um, <clears throat> Viola has over 20 years of experience in the field of meteorology and disaster management combined. She's a trained weather forecaster with a diploma in meteorology, a bachelor's degree in geography, and a master's degree in risk crisis and disaster management. She has extensive experience in public weather forecasting and public education and awareness in support of disaster risk management. Mrs. Pascal has a passion for social research aimed at improving risk communication that propels individual and collective protective actions to reduce the impact of hazards on lives. Key research areas have included flood risk perception, risk communication and flood management in the Commonwealth of Dominica, focusing on the vulnerable community of Colibistri and linked to tropical storm Erica, flood research in Western Jamaica, and recently assessment of gender and disability inclusion in public emergency shelter management in Dominica. She believes that to be socially responsible is not an option, but a duty to oneself and a service to others. IOM Dominica is happy to welcome Viola as the project assistant to the podium um, to introduce the agenda and the project to us. Viola. In the interest of time, let me just acknowledge the protocols already established and just jump right in to thank all our previous speakers for their remarks that so adequately captures the work being done in the region and globally to address the issues relating to climate change, disasters and human mobility. Special thanks to the premier of Montserrat and the chairperson of the OECS, the Honorable Joseph Easton Taylor Farrell for supporting this event. My task over the next few minutes is to introduce the project, 
integrating the human security approach in disaster displacement and environmental migration policies in the Eastern Caribbean. Right, much of this has already been highlighted. Here we have Barbuda in the eye of the storm in 2017. And in this case, this was major hurricane Irma. We have the eruption in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. In Montserrat, we have the eruption of another volcano. And of course, in Dominica, major hurricane Maria devastated Dominica in 2017. And all of this resulted in the movement of people uh, disrupting lives and livelihoods, as well as increasing the insecurities that normally um, arise with people on the move. And this is basically the background of this joint program. This joint program was developed to address the issues that normally arise with people the insecurities that develop as people are displaced from their, their, their known environment, their, their environment that they are accustomed to. So this has already been established from our previous speakers, the recurrent exposure of Eastern Caribbean seeds to climate related threats and the devastation to lives and livelihoods. And this is further compounded by the impact of COVID-19. But in the case of COVID-19, the main issue we would have seen was uh, not being able to move about as you would have liked. And there are other issues that came about as a result of this immobility. However, all of these work together to increase human insecurities. So this joint program is being implemented with the IOM and partners to promote the human security approach as a framework to address the challenges in relation to environmental migration and disaster displacement. And as I mentioned before, the added issues that are presented by COVID-19. This program has two key expected outcomes. The first being to improve the policy coherence at the national level in the Eastern Caribbean on the different forms of human mobility in the context of disasters and climate change. And the second being the development and adoption of human security and COVID-19 sensitive regional frameworks um, to address cross-border displacement and evacuation. And how do we intend to achieve these key outcomes? Five um, critical outputs are being implemented under this project to, uh, to achieve these outcomes. The first being national policy frameworks and strategies are being developed to assess the 11 Eastern Caribbean countries and territories. And this is to determine the extent to which human security and human mobility issues are being addressed in national policies. And we will hear more about the products that were developed under this output being the human security assessment tool and the summary country assessment reports. Some persons would have received some of these documents this morning. The second output would have been a strong, we looked at a stronger integration of mobility considerations in climate strategies. And this component is being focused on by the UNF C. The third output under this project, regional best practices developed to facilitate the harmonization of national practices and protection of persons crossing borders and falling closely behind that new protocols developed for cross-border evacuations. Now these two docu um, outputs, in best, the best practices document, we'll hear more about that today in the afternoon session. And tomorrow we will look at the protocols and also we'll be having a TTX um, tabletop simulation exercise to test these protocols. And finally, public awareness is always important. So we look at enhanced awareness on the value of integrating the human security approach in environmental migration mechanisms. 
We have touched on this already, just to highlight the partners under this project who make this um, project a reality. The United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security are the donors of, for this project. So they make all of this possible under the guidance of the UN Residence Coordinator's Office, IOM being the lead implementation agency. UNFCCC, of course, is also a partner. The OECS, who makes all of this possible as well by being our partners on this and the platform for disaster displacement. And of course, you, our national stakeholders, government representatives, and CSO organizations. Who are the beneficiaries under this project? The protocol and associate member states of the OECS from the British Virgin Islands in the North to Grenada in the South are the beneficiaries under this project. And as I mentioned before, we do appreciate all the support that we have been receiving from all of the national stakeholders on this project. The purpose of this workshop, why are we here today really? And I would have mentioned some of these already. We have some key um, documents that we want to look at and your input is very critical because at the end of the day, we want to ensure that these products are what we would say are fit for purpose. We do not want these documents to become something that will sit on the shelf somewhere and not being used. So we're gonna be looking at the assessment tool and we intend to present an overview of the endorsed environmental migration, disaster displacement and human security assessment tool. We're gonna to be looking at the best practices, um, non-binding regional OECS best practices to facilitate the harmonization of national practices. The, the protocols, as I mentioned before, our TTX and the public awareness. So this is the focus of the workshop over the next two days. And importantly, and the OECS will take the lead on this. We hope to have coming out of this, a ministerial declaration, a high level commitment through the endorsement of a declaration by the ministers on human mobility in the context of disasters, environmental degradation and climate change. And many of you in the room would agree that having this high level support will make your job a little easier, knowing that you have this national buy-in that can support you to make your life a little easier in your daily operations. And this is just a summary of the agenda. Day one, I would have mentioned most of this already. Um, based on your agenda, that everyone should have a copy of the agenda. The next set of activities that we will be moving into, we'll have a panel discussion where we'll hear from our partners and their perspective on the project as it relates to human security and their various area of um, specialization. The next session, we'll look at the tools, groundbreaking tools developed under this project. Key being the assessment tool and the country assessment reports that looked, as I said, at how human security and human mobility is being addressed by national documents. And it also made some recommendations as to where do we go next? How do we incorporate the recommendations that um, would have been made. The second session for the day would look at um, the best practices document. So this is where we are hoping to have the input of all the stakeholders in the room and as well as our online participants in tearing this document apart and to ensure, as we would like to say, it's fit for purpose. On day two, on day two, we'll have the presentation starting the day, looking at the experiences from Antigua and Barbuda, as well as St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I'm sure that we all enjoyed the video that was shown um, before, where we saw the experiences of some persons who were impacted. So we will have presentations on day two to begin that process. Following that, we will have presentations from our consultants who develop the best practice, uh, the protocols document. And thereafter, we will move into the tabletop simulation exercise. To, as I said, to assess the protocols and to ensure that it is fit for purpose as our disaster managers in the room would agree. When we are under the stress, when we are in the moment of crisis, it is easier for us if we have something already prepared that we can just reach for and we can just run with that. So I hope to have, we will all have 
and engaging experience over the next two days. And like I said, we really want to hear from you, our stakeholders here in the room, as well as those persons online to ensure that at the end of the day, these products are well developed. You have We have the, the input of our national stakeholders and they are uh, fit for purpose and ready to be used. Before we move into our coffee break, which is the next item on the agenda, we will just go into a brief um, introductory period where we hear from you, our stakeholders in the room. You basically will just briefly state your name, what country you're representing, and probably one or two words as to what you expect from this workshop over the next uh, two days. So thank you very much. And again, I'm happy to have everyone here and looking forward to working with you. They have other mics. There are other mics. You know. Um, morning, everyone. My name is. My name is Juan Carlos Mendez, and uh, I work for the platform on disaster displacement, the BDD. I'm based in Costa Rica, Central America. Thank you. Morning, everyone. My name is Pablo Escribano. I work with, with Viola and Natasha at, at the International Organization for Migration, uh, and I'm also based in, in Costa Rica. Very nice to see you all. Yes, good morning, everyone. Clarence Henry from the OECS Commission. Good morning, everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Jason Hills. I'm representing Sedima Barbados. Good morning, all. Joyce Lynn Hughes representing CARICOM Impacts. I'm the Border Security Affairs Specialist. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kimisha Thomas, Senior Policy Advisor in the Ministry of Environment, Rural and Modernization, Kainago Upliftment, and Constituency Empowerment in Dominica. Good morning, everyone. My name is Esther Rigobert. I am the Permanent Secretary in the Office of the Prime Minister. It gives me great pleasure to be here, of course, to support um, Director Nemo and other officials from our ministry, and of course, to represent the Prime Minister and his office, the cabinet, in terms of um, policy endorsement and or engagement uh, with key stakeholders as we go through those important discussions over the next two days. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Forbes. I'm from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, representing the National Emergency Management Organization. Uh, good morning, everyone. Terence Walters from uh, Grenada. I'm the National Disaster Coordinator at the National Disaster Management Agency. Pleasant good morning. Inspector Elian Purcell out of Grenada, Acting Head of Immigration. Good morning, everyone. Maida Santayalan, Regional Collaboration Center for the Caribbean and the UNFCCC. Morning, Marlon Anatole, consultant looking at the guidelines as well as the protocols. Good morning, I'm Mark Curtin, and I also represent the group of consultants, the Alentol Institutes of Social Sciences. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hannah Katwaru, also consultant. Good morning, everyone. Abdiya Samuel, National Disaster Coordinator for Nemo, St. Kitts and Nevis. I bring you spicy greetings from Grenada. My name is Samantha Dixon. I am the president of Grenada Red Cross Society. And I would love following this discussion with all the colleagues that our work in community is made easier by translating policy to actions using technology and at the same time, regarding the needs of our vulnerable populations. Good morning, everyone. I am Pedro Gari, Assistant Chief Immigration Officer from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Passports and Immigration Department. Thank you. And everyone, I'm Mr. Keshan King, Human Rights Desk Officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade of St. Vincent and the Grenadines.
Good morning, everyone. Michelle Ambrose, and I'm representing the Department of Disaster Management in the British Virgin Islands. Good morning, everyone. Ken Shalry, Sergeant at the Immigration Department, HIA St. Lucia. Good morning, everyone. Crescent Lionel, Inspector at Immigration Department. Morning, everyone. My name is Walt Lucien, Corporal of Police at SSC Department, St. Lucia. Good morning, everyone. Shikari Gravilis. I am a Technical Specialist for Regional Integration at the OECS Commission. Um, and my unit directly focuses on the free movement of persons. So I'm happy to be here to experience this workshop and see how the OECS Commission can continue to support. Greetings from the British Virgin Islands. I'm Laura Reimer, Assistant Secretary for Public Policy in the Office of the Deputy Governor. Hello, good morning. My name is Stephen Adawin. Uh, I'm also one of the IOM consultants, and I'm very happy to be here. So in the moment, we'll be looking at the, some of the issues we've identified in our application of the human security uh, assessment tool that we, uh, assessment that we did for the various countries. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues, attorney, security and justice policy advisor within the office of the deputy governor. My name is Alva McKenzie Agard. Morning, everyone. My name is Lance Brown. I am senior consular affairs officer in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Antigua and Barbuda and IOM focal point for Antigua and Barbuda. Everyone, my name is Sherrod James, Director of the National Office of Disaster Services, Disaster Officer and Tegan Barbuda. Good day to all. Uh, Luke DeFreitas, Major Crimes Unit, Royal St. Lucia Police Force. Good morning, all. Maria Mida, St. Lucia, Director, National Emergency Management Organization. Morning all, my name is Keith Thompson. Welcome to the most beautiful island in the Caribbean. Do not allow the headline news prevent you from enjoying St. Lucia. Do enjoy St. Lucia, welcome. Good day everyone, my name is Junior Williams. I'm Acting Inspector of Police Central Intelligence Unit, um, Royal St. Lucia Police Force. I'm glad to be here. And of course, we hope that um, our networking will take us further um, as we move forward. Good morning, all. Stephen Victorin, Superintendent of Police. I oversee this area that you presently in, the Northern Division. Good morning, everyone. Jeff F. Bernadine, 266, attached to SSU, St. Lucia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Silke Tobias. I'm the Deputy Permanent Secretary within the Department of Sustainable Development. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kate Wilson. I am the Legal Officer in the Department of Sustainable Development, and welcome to St. Lucia. Good morning, Josette Schalmein, Program Officer within the Climate and Disaster Resilience Unit at the OECS Commission. Good morning, everybody. Annette Fleischer, working for the German Development Corporation, GSZ, and responsible for a program called Human Mobility in the Context of Climate Change. I'm based in St. Lucia and work very closely with our partner organization, the OECS Commission. Oh, let me thank everyone for introducing themselves. I know you'd love to take a break. No. Oh. Yeah, I'm in a rush. <laughs>
Good morning, everyone. I work for the United Nations Resident Coordinator's Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. I am Lorraine Nicholas, the UN Country Coordination Officer assigned to St. Lucia. Good morning, Samantha Charles. I'm from the legal unit at the OECS Commission.